I'm John Wright, a faculty member oh, for the last 35 years in the departments of African American and African Studies and English. And I'm Rob Hahn. I'll be asking the questions. Today is December 17th, 2018, and we are on the campus, the West Bank of the University of Minnesota. Let me start about as basically as it comes. Tell me your first memory of Dinkytown. I came to the university as a freshman in the fall of 1963. I'd had no experience of Dinkytown uh, before that, and it was an entirely new kind of space, a place for me, clearly associated with the campus. And uh, it, was a, it was a really exciting, uh, you know, commercial district with uh, uh, a lot of the uh, arts-oriented music, books, and uh, street life that I found, uh, you know, new and exciting. So for me, it was a place where I, you know, had lunch regularly, where I went to, you know, to meet friends, to socialize, and also to party. Uh, later on, again, I would live in the Dickytown area in the, as a student in apartments and so on in the, in the, in the uh, in Dickytown district. What was it, in your opinion, at that time, I think you arrived uh, 63 or so as a freshman, yeah. right? Yeah. What was it about that time, some would call it the heyday of Dickytown, that gave it so much so much character, made it so alive. Well, in those years, of course, it was, it was in the midst of the 1960s and all the upsurge in terms of, of youth rebellion, student protest, uh, the, uh, the, the energies again from the, uh, you know, the, 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 the counterculture and also from, uh, from civil rights and the rise of the black power movement, the black arts movement. And the mix of all these things uh, you know, came through student life and campus life and flowed into, into Dinkytown, where oftentimes things that weren't being dealt with in classes, in the classrooms and so forth, got a chance to, uh, to, to mix and ferment in a freer, more open atmosphere. You had a one-sentence statement when we last spoke, or when we met previously, and I want you to elaborate on it in, uh, as it pertains to Dinkytown and maybe the campus on the whole. Excuse me, you said the paradigm of social protest changed. How so? The Vietnam War had a significant part to do with that, and the, the, the convergence of the Vietnam War and the civil rights movement, and in particular, again, in the mid-60s with the transition from civil rights to black power, uh, you know, brought a whole new uh, dynamic, a, a increasingly radical dynamic to uh, the, uh, the, the politics on the campus and, again, to the politics of the, of the, of the counterculture during those years. You, uh, you alluded to it and you said there was that bohemian dimension to that. Yeah, some folks always uh, thought about Dinkytown as a kind of a you know, Midwestern Greenwich Village. Of course, in scale, it, uh, we didn't, didn't compare with Greenwich Village at all. But yeah, the mix, again, of a kind of a New York bohemian style, counterculture uh, lifestyle, co coffee houses and shops and uh, uh, you know, late night music and parties and of course, the, uh, you know, the growing rebellion against older generation sexual mores and uh, the mix again of, of drugs, alcohol, and uh, illicit drugs as well became part of that heady process of, uh, of, of confronting the larger society and also you know, trying to chart some new ways to the future. How did you dress back in the day? Well, I guess at the height of those years, uh, <laughs> I, I, I was, wear, was wearing bell, bell, bell bottoms wildly colored bell bottoms and flowery shirts and uh, big leather big apple hats and so on so and again at the, at the time I had a large afro and a and a large long sideburns on the side so I guess I fit well into that kind of mix and it was a kind of a, a convergence again of the emerging counterculture at the time and uh, African American cultural nationalism and the black arts and the, the inf influx of influences again from African American cultural corridors, sorry, from the, from the, you know, the, the classic soul music of the era, to funk and, uh, and, uh, and free jazz that became you know, part of the milieu that's, you know, that, that uh, spread into, into uh, you know, cuisine and to uh, costuming and all the rest. How did the, uh, the different backgrounds, be it race related or cultural related, get together and uh, interact with each other in Dickytown? Well, there were a lot of, you know, in, in, whether you're in the coffee house context or on street corner, because again, one of the features of the time was a lot of street corner 
uh, activity, which sometimes we involved artists sitting on the, on, the, on the street corners, on the sidewalks, you know, hawking their works, but talking and conversing with passers-by and potential buyers for their, for their enterprises. And, you know, all that contributed to, a, I think, a pretty you know, free and open discussion, again, from a variety of different cultural and national backgrounds. And all that was, I think, really exciting. You used a term when we talked uh, previously, wigger. How would you define that? <laughs> well, <laughs> wigger, of course, is short for white nigger, uh, to, to use the pejorative. But, you know, the term, that concept, I mean, Norman Mailer's essay, The White Negro, uh, which was basically a, a, a significant part again of that, uh, uh, you know, that then new wave uh, rebellion against tr and traditional larger mores, coined this idea of the hipster as a model again for um, r cultural rebellion in the in the white world, uh, but, but at the same time a, a, a point of connection that in part indicated the extent to which. African American lifestyles and attitudes and music and ways of talking and walking and dancing and moving were, were aff affecting the larger society. So, you know, wigger is one of a long series of terms that have, have, have basically addressed this kind of symbiotic relationship between African Americans and the larger society, a relationship that goes back into the 19th century. Uh, so, in, in the 19th century, bohemians, countercultural types like Walt Whitman, we're saying back in the 1850s that uh, the, the new American opera would most likely be found on the lips and in the music of slaves. So again, that whole history, uh, again, about these alternative ways of thinking about culture, and particularly about bourgeois culture, uh, and African Americans as a, a counter-cultural point of reference is a long history. Do you remember the protest uh, on the ROTC building? either that day of or the day after the Kent State killings? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, in fact, had been, I had a short, a short stint in Air Force ROTC in that old armory building, but I didn't last more than a semester in Air Force ROTC. Their ways and mine, there were too many points of, of, of conflict. So, I, yeah, I was, yeah, I was very familiar with, with, uh, with that because, yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 the, 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 the armory and these other uh, local uh, military recruiting offices, and there were several of them on campus during those days, became you know, staging points for protests. Let's talk about some of the characters and some of the locations yeah. in Dickey Town to get your, uh, your thoughts and memories on them, starting with Walking Phil, Phil Holland. Phil Holland, again, <laughs> became a, a Dinky Town legend during the years um, that he was on the scene. He lived in the area, moved around in a variety of rooming houses and so forth. Um, his origins always remained a bit of a, a bit of a mystery. There are a lot of legends and stories about, about Phil Holland. But he was a very um, stately, dignified, tall, lean brother who had come from the Deep South, and most of the stories I had heard, or that I can recall Phil talking about, were from Atlanta, somewhere near, near Atlanta, one of the big southern cities and it somehow ended up in Minnesota and uh, in the campus area. Uh, there were stories that he had gone to uh, St. John's up in Collegeville or one or another school here locally. He rarely ever wanted to give much detail about uh, his personal background, but uh, he could give you tremendous detail about almost anything else. He was a tremendous conversationalist and could talk uh, in a very knowledgeable way about a wide array of subjects from business and economics to politics to culture and art to sexuality and so on. So yeah, Phil was, a, was, was one of the very memorable figures who was around Dinky Town for years. And fairly dapper. The way very he dapper, yeah. Most often in, in, in his heyday, he was usually in a suit, uh, sometimes a blazer and so forth, um, with the passage of time that, uh, that, that changed and his, he wasn't quite as debonair uh, later on as he was in the, in the earlier years, in his heyday. Some people I su suggest, uh, I've talked to suggest that maybe he was a little off uh, from a, a, a yes. you know, neuro yeah. standpoint. Yeah, yeah. I don't think uh, from a clinical standpoint that you would pin Phil down as, as, as being uh, in, in any way um, psychologically you know, dangerous or dysfunctional. Uh, but there was a, a, a point at which his relationship to reality became fuzzy. 
and that would you know come out you know, periodically in the way he talked. But he could carry on very coherent, extended conversations about uh, complex subjects uh, with 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 great ease. But uh, yes, there was something about Phil that uh, I think made it difficult for Phil uh, to otherwise to fit in the larger society, and because you know the the atmosphere in Dickey Town around the campus was. Uh, a more free-floating kind of world in that kind of context he could operate I think without any any major obstacles. Another character that you told me about and I hope you'll elaborate here Anthony A. Nelson. Anthony A. Nelson, Tony Nelson. Tony Nelson was, an, was another one of the figures who kind of moved uh, back and forth between the campus arena and uh, yeah, the Minneapolis north side and south side and St. Paul. He was a poet, uh, you know, a freelance poet and um, a large dark skinned broad smiled brother who had one leg uh, but who didn't uh, allow his uh, one leggedness to uh, constrict in any way either his poetry or his relationship with, with, with people in the dinky town and the, and the campus area. He published his poem, most of them were, were what you'd call broadsides. Uh, occasional poems or poems dedicated to particular individuals or to self-exploration. Um, and he published them in typescript uh, pamphlets, basically, that were produced by his own publishing company. Um, somewhere had, a, I think, an address down on Lake Street for some of these uh, collections. One of them, I can recall, was called uh, Ballads for, S for Small Time Losers. Uh, well, it was one of those. And he would characteristically, in the uh, in the opening pages of the of the pamphlets, give a long lists of all the people who had either bought a copy of the the poems or or were his friends or associates or supporters, and many of them kind of reflected the uh, the poetry that was a part of fusion of the the older generation of beat uh, poets' work, and he he was quite familiar with uh, the Ginsburgs and Ferling Gettys and so on at the time, but also it reflected the, the new, what was called the new black poetry that was emerging then in the context of the black arts movement. So in that sense, Tony was part of a local manifestation of the black arts and their meetings here with uh, the counterculture and the, the bohemian side of campus life. I think you told me that uh, uh, he was, uh, maybe it was a mutual relationship, the young ladies liked him quite a bit. He was, yes, he, he, he had a particular, um, verve in dealing with uh, male-female relationships and sexuality and sensuality. And uh, I think he, uh, his way of, of addressing male-female relationships had struck a particular chord with many of the young women on campus, again, who became some of the more his ardent supporters and, and uh, purchasers and distributors of his, his collections of poetry. Another well-known individual in Dickey Town in the day was Melvin McCosh from McCosh Books. McCosh, and, and McCosh, you know, of course, there were several bookstores, the older bookstores there. McCosh, I think, became the best known of the old line uh, bookstore owners. And uh, you know, his bookstore became a, you know, a real hangout. And McCosh himself was enormously learned and erudite in terms of the book world. And uh, if you came in and asked him uh, about any particular topic, uh, you know, he could immediately uh, not just lead you to books that he had on hand, but point you towards titles he didn't own um, that you should uh, that you should think about. So yes, Melvin was a I think a really uh, uh, you know pivotal character in the Dinky Town scene in those years. Were you aware of or even involved in the little sit-in at Bridgman's that was done on his behalf when they wanted to? Exp Span Bridgman to get rid of uh, McCosh yeah. books. Yeah, I, w I was very much aware of it. I wasn't directly involved in the in the Bridgman's protest, but that, like two or three other protests that took place in Dinky Town in those years, that involved basically corporate enterprises uh, trying to displace some of the traditional small shop owners, whether they were bookstore owners or restaurants or coffee house owners, you know, became causes célèbres for uh, you know for the the Dinky Town. Uh, aficionados and campus students and so forth. So yes, so Melvin McCullough, McCosh and the, and the, uh, the protest against Bridgman's were in part a, a, an attempt again to try to keep Dinky Town from going over to the, into the hands of the corporate uh, merchandisers. And one of the more famous ones, if not most famous, was the protest over the Red Barn. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
let's talk about uh, the bookstores. We talked a little bit about the bookstores, uh, the coffee shops. Uh, I think you said it was in the coffee shops, uh, or maybe in a different location, where you honed your skill playing pool. <laughs> well, there weren't any any full size uh, pocket billiard or billiard tables in Dinky Town then, but several of the restaurants and bars had small bar tables, eight foot, six foot or eight foot tables, uh, where you know, students played and gambled on the pool on the pool table. Um, I was part of that enterprise, but I did most of my pool playing in Kaufman Union, in the old uh, pool room at the east end of, of Kaufman in those years where you had full-size tables, uh, both pocket billiards and billiards tables and snooker tables. And uh, yeah, yeah, the, the group that played there often spilled over into the Dinky Town uh, clubs and bars and uh, that became an you know, alt alt alternate arena again for playing pool. But I spent uh, a lot of evenings uh, into the late night uh, playing pool on the bar tables in, uh, in Dinky Town. What are your memories of Al's breakfast? Well, that Al's breakfast had, had marvelous breakfast food, but you couldn't get into Al's because there were almost always a line, unless you went at some very strange hour to try to get in there. And once you did get in, you could hardly turn around. The, you know, Al and the, and the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the waiters and waitresses behind the bar, you know, were, were in, in motion, in frantic motion almost all the time. Uh, but it was a marvelous place if you could get in the Al's. And of course, it be, had become, been an institution there for so long that uh, uh, you know, it, was, it was hard to go to Dinky Town and at least not at least try to get a peek into Al's breakfast. I most often would get into Al's very early in the morning after a, light, after a night out one way or the other and get there before the regular morning, morning crowd got in. What about Mama D's? Did you spend much time eating there? Yes, a lot of time in Ma Mama D's and Vecchio's. Uh, which, you know, they made great pizza, had uh, um, really flavorful, spicy food and the Italian fare, I guess part of my own, my uh, inclinations towards Italian food. And perhaps even more than the, the, than the pizza, I, I love the uh, Italian sausage and peppers uh, dishes, entrees that they had on the, the menus there at Mama D's and, and at Vecchio's. You told me uh, some of your thoughts and memories of the street corner musicians. Well, what, uh, did people just like throw out their instrument uh, or open their case and start playing? Well, I think some of that, some of the street corner uh, musicians were in fact students who were enrolled in the School of Music here and were trying to make a few bucks or to hone their craft by sitting on, this, on the street corners in, in Dinky Town and playing violins or guitars or or wind instruments or whatever and drawing crowds and, and attracting a few dollars uh, in, in process. But I think many of them were, um, you know, were, were, uh, were, were university music students, but some of them were, you know, itinerant musicians from around town who saw the Dinky Town scene as one place where they could come and perhaps pick up a few bucks in the course of a day. Well, you may have said this and maybe I didn't hear it. Did Anthony A. Nelson recite poetry on the street corner? Rarely. Okay, okay. Rarely. Okay, let me just go over some notes here. Because we've covered most oh, the of the scholar. Yeah, the scholar. Memories of the scholar. Yeah, yeah. Well, like the scholar was, uh, of course, it was, it, was, it was famous, of course, in part because of Dylan's um, <coughs> time there as a musician. But it was a great you know, coffee house atmosphere. Of course, it was dingy in many ways. and. Uh, it didn't made no 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 effort to uh, to try to make it look chic or modern, but that was part of the you know, the, the coffee house ethos of those uh, years. Um, I didn't go to the to the scholar much for the coffee. I wasn't a coffee drinker, a whore. But again, you know the food, the sandwiches, and uh, you know the music. Those were the primary draws, uh, you know, for the uh, for the scholar. And uh, you know the crowd again. It was the same kind of of campus bohemian crowd that uh, was part of, of, of Dinky Town's appeal to young folks who were basically you know, exploring the possibilities of life and politics and love and all the rest. What sort of music did you like back in the day? 
I was, you know, I'm a product of the, the generation of, uh, of classic soul. So again, the early 60s music, I mean, you know, the Motown scene was, you know, was, was central for me. So they were in the world of the miracles and the impressions and Smokey Robinson and Marvin Gaye and, and all the rest. Plus, again, you know, the emergence of, of, uh, of funk and, uh, and free jazz. So you know, the, the music of James Brown and Aretha Franklin, Nina Simone, so forth, but also some of the experimental you know, free jazz groups. And there were a number of free jazz musicians and ensembles who worked the music scene here in the, in the Twin Cities. Some of them were imports from Chicago, as was the case with the blues. Again, I was a heavy blues aficionado. And then there, there were then, there were a number of blues clubs in the area over here. Probably the best known, again, to emerge on those years was, was, was probably the Caboose. But uh, Archie Bunkers, later on Walebskis and so forth, they weren't in Dinky Town proper. But the spillover from, from all of that, and again, the, the, the influx again of Chicago blues and jazz musicians here who played it oftentimes at places like the Scholar um, and so on were part of the, of the Dinky Town uh, orbit. When you compare Dinky Town today <coughs> to the time you spent there in the 60s and early 70s, how would you describe change and what has been lost? Most of the uh, places in Dinky Town and now are part of chain operations, at least many of them certainly are. There are some still small boutiques and so forth. The biggest losses are, are if you have the bookstores themselves. I think the uh, uh, you know, Kristen's uh, book house is, I think, the, the last survivor of the old the book house scene uh, in Dinky Town. And we do have you know, bars that have some cat coffee house uh, you know, dimension to them, and there is some live music there. But uh, you know, the mix, Again, of those forms, uh, and of the you know the visual arts, the painters and so forth, and mix of painters and poets and musicians and street folk who were part of the old Nicky Town scene. Um, that combination simply doesn't exist in today's Nicky Town. What impacted uh, living in and interacting in Dicky Town, as you look back, have on your life as you know it today? I think for me. Uh, because I, like uh, many of my peers, you know, was wrestling with, uh, um, like I say, you know, social values, political values, and so on. And there was a mix of, of competing ideas and values and lifestyles that, that were on display in Dicky Town um, that at least gave me a broader sense of possibilities in terms of the kind of choices that I made. I was also you know, moving back and forth between Dinky Town and uh, the African-American communities in the, in the Twin Cities here on the north side in Plymouth, the old Plymouth Avenue of those years of the 1960s, uh, in the, the Rondo District in St. Paul, uh, you know, with, with its uh, shops and community centers and so forth, and in South Minneapolis. So Dinkytown was part of a, of a, of a cluster of, of discrete communities that I circulated through, and Dinkytown had its own kind of distinctive flavor there. I mean, part of the mix was, in some ways, it was more international because, again, in this mix of, of, uh, of artists and, um, and uh, eccentrics, again, there were significant numbers of, of students and people uh, from abroad. Again, one of the, ar the artists I remember from those years, again, was a, South, was a, was a Zimbabwean Rhodesian artist named Rex Mary Peary, who was one of the painters who regularly um, it was on the scene in Dinky Town and who to some extent again sold his work or, 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 or exhibited his work either on the, on the streets or in shops there. Uh, Bobby Biddle, Robert Biddle was another uh, African-American artist again who you saw in, those, in, that, in that terrain and who also moved uh, in the gallery world here locally but also in African-American communities and so forth. So it was this kind of this cross current of cultural communities that uh, Dinky, Pound, Dinky Town was part of that had I think, a big impact on me. A couple final things. Uh, I'm going to run a couple names past you. Tell me if you have any memories of them or right. even knew them. Right. Bill Tilton. I knew Bill Tilton quite well. Bill Tilton was part of the, uh, the SDS orbit on campus. He, Art Himmelman, who uh, Art Himmelman, I think, was, if I recall, was president of SDS when the Afro-American Action Committee, of which I was uh, was an executive committee member, 
um, when, after the King assassination in spring of, of 68, when we uh, presented a list of seven demands that I actually drafted uh, in the days following the King assassination, we present, present, presented then to, to Malcolm Moose in the following January of 1969 when the university's intransigence led us to take over uh, the administration building, to let us take over Morrill Hall, Bill Tilton and SDS were important allies for us and tried to, to, uh, to, to form a ring around the building to minimize the potential conflict between some of the, uh, the, uh, the right-wing um, anti-takeover protesters who wanted to basically you know, create uh, visible conflict. We interviewed Bill last week and he, like you, has a real strong persona. Yeah. How would you describe him back in the day? Well, Bill was, uh, uh, Bill was fiery, um, but, uh, you know, he wasn't, I think, a, a natural order uh, in that respect. Um, you know, he was obviously highly intelligent and so forth, but there's a side of Bill that's, uh, that's very thoughtful and, uh, and uh, particular about what he says and does and so on. Um, so he was very effective, I think, as a communicator. Um, uh, and uh, in that regard, again, he's, you know, his, his commitments, his thinking and ideas, I think, were very, very critical in terms of the interchange that we had with SDS during those years. What am I forgetting to ask about that you want to add with regard to Dinky Town? Well, I think the, uh, I think I, I have mentioned, again, the, uh, the circle of, of parties that were also part of the social atmosphere surrounding Dinky Town. And because many of us who lived in Dinky Town, I again for a while, I lived at 7th and 7th Street Southeast in an old, uh, you know, three-story ramshackle um, duplex. But uh, you know, many of us got involved in parties that bridged some of these different cultural communities. And one of the links clearly was with the world of the fraternities and sororities and the parties life that they had. And that was, I think, a, a significant milieu also. And sometimes, you know, what, you would go to Dinky Town, again, to places like Vestios and Mama D's and uh, so on, and the Scholar, et cetera, to make connections to parties to find out what was going on and where, and whether it was in fraternity uh, or sorority houses or in this apartment or that, or whether it was linked up to the uh, to, the, to the, the campus varsity athletes groups and so on. So it became, that became, in that sense, it became a kind of staging ground also for some of the, the late night social activities. Oh, you got any questions you want to ask? I do, I do. Um, what about the development of, since you lived on 7th and 7th, the development of 35W and how it split Dinky Town in so many ways? Oh boy. <clears throat> I'm trying to remember when when 35W came through those years. Um, I mean, it did because, of course, it cut, uh, you know, you, you, were, you were north of 10th Street, and the, uh, you know, the bridge that ran through there in 35W did indeed, you know, cut off part of Dink, old Dinky Town from. Uh, that part that we now associate basically with the Heaven, he Hennepin Avenue side, which now you know some folks refer to as NoHo or whatever else, but the, the, you know, the, the Central Avenue and Hennepin corridor. Uh, but also, I mean, in those days too, uh, of course, the West Bank campus community um, didn't exist in the uh, early '60s, mid '60s. The West Bank of the campus didn't emerge till later on. But this whole Cedar Riverside area was a kind of independent region also, but it had strong links to Dinky Town. And oft times, again, you would circulate outside of Dinky Town to the Cedar Riverside bars and restaurants and so forth. So the places at, at Seven Corners, for instance, like Sergeant Preston's um, uh, and the other institutions, most of which are now gone there, again, became part of basically the same kind of campus orbit. So Dinky Town and uh, Seven Corners and Stadium Village were a kind of a triangular set of campus related communities that you move through and they were in many places in our minds and so forth 
closely integrated because you could hop from one to the other and they all had their own distinctive differences. In fact, you know, uh, the old, on, the, on the West Bank, uh, we talked about, about the you know, Bohemian aspects of, uh, of Dinkytown. Well, the well, West Bank area was called Bohemian Flats. Again, before, they, they, you know, before the, the bridge, the Washington Avenue Bridge was completed and the West Bank campus was built. Uh, so, you know, this whole business about the Bohemian side of things made Dinkytown part of this kind of triangulation of the three, again, Dinkytown, Stadium Village, and the Cedar Riverside area. The other question I had is, um, when you think of Dilly, uh, Dinkytown today, what are your feelings? How would you characterize how you feel about it today? Well, I still go to Dinkytown. And uh, you know, the places I'm most likely to, to go or be seen these days are the, uh, uh, the um, <coughs> Annie's Parlor, um, which still serves, in my mind, the best <laughs> hamburgers in Diggy Town and is kind of a rustic kind of a survivor of those that that of that old scene. Um, Annie's Parlor on the one hand, and uh, you know what used to be Gray's Drug, uh, there on the corner of Fourth and and uh, and and Fourteenth. And um, boy, I'm blocking here now. Um, varsity Theater. If you ever go to any. Oh place? yes, used to go with the Varsity the Varsity Theater. Also, although I haven't gone to Varsity Theater for, for many, many, many years. Of course, the Varsity Theater in Dinkytown and the, the Oak Street uh, Cinema and Stadium Village were, were, were primary movie houses, small movie houses, again, in those areas uh, where we you know, w went off times. And uh, you know, I can remember sitting in, I think it was the Varsity rather than the uh, the Oak Street Cinema, where I saw um, back in 1967 or 68, the film version of Leroy Jones's Dutchman, which was a transfixing um, cinema experience for me, and where the world of, of, of black bohemianism, all right, and the world of the, the Wiggers, uh, you know, came together in a highly dramatic and violent way, but. Uh, Again, off times, again, part of it, you know, the scenes of the, for the Varsity Theater and the Oak Street Cinema was where avant-garde international films were, were, were shown. I perhaps didn't allude to that earlier on, but again, those were places where, again, uh, the kinds of films and crowds that you didn't see elsewhere in the metro area congregated. And again, you had a really heady mix, again, of ideas, artistic attitudes, again, the infusion of of continental European attitudes and culture and art and film and so forth, uh, at least got, has some kind of local manifestation. 